Hey y'all, this is Brown at IF Brown, and tonight we are going to be talking about the movie Cyborg on Blu-ray. So Cyborg is one of those movies that I have had a rather interesting experience with over the years. The first time I watched it, or at least a significant portion of it, I was a much younger man. I was knee-high to a mud turtle. I was a little kid. And I think I was in a hotel with my folks uh, at this point in time, and it was on TV. I remember watching it, and it's like, man, this is a pretty cool movie. Then, fast forward several years later, I get a chance to re-watch it. And it, I think it was like, on, yeah, it was on a kind of bare-bones DVD. And I remember thinking, I mean, yeah, the fight scenes are cool, but this is a pretty shitty movie. So fast forward several more years later, and I have a chance to watch it again and the reason I rewatch it you know this third time is because this is around the time that I I've been doing you know the reviews here on YouTube and some of the stuff I've done are uh, films by Albert Peon who is who or I should say was you know one of the most um, you know well-known figures within the b-movie scene as far as you know directors go and so uh, very influential um, but unfortunately like a lot of his output you know tends to be less than stellar but when he's on he is on and so cyborg was one of his more successful films and like it's one it's probably one of the few movies that even you know mainstream audiences are familiar with so there you go but I had mentioned Cyborg on the occasions that I had you know, covered some of his movies, and so I'm thinking to myself, okay, if I'm gonna, you know, you know, talk about it here and there, I may as well just go ahead and watch it and review it, both for myself and for my audience, you know, because, you know, Cyborg being a big um, fixture on the B movie scene, I mean, if, I mean, hey, I like B movies, you know, so I may as well, you know, cover it, and if I'm gonna um, do a review on it. You know, I may as well do a review from a more up-to-date impression as opposed to, say, relying on memories from when I was younger. So, anyway, uh, I re-watched it, and much to my surprise, it was actually a cool movie. I mean, there were some cheesy parts, to be sure, but overall, this was... I honestly think it was a good movie. Um, and so, you know, the, you know, the way to go with it, not the DVD, uh, but go with you know the blu-ray the the collector's edition you know special edition where you want to call it because i mean it looks good sounds good and there's also quite a few you know bonus features here you know that go into say you know how how the movie was made and what have you so if you like supplemental material uh the collector's edition of cyborg's definitely the way to go so okay so cyborg um it was made in 1989 and the story um, is, you know, you know, it takes place in, you know, the uh, it's post-apocalyptic, okay? So there's you know, this plague that's, you know, gotten out of hand and ravaged, the, you know, the world, you know, all over. And people are dying left and right. And amongst the chaos, um, several gangs of flesh pirates have emerged to terrorize, you know, the people who are still trying to make a living in this world, or who are trying to survive in this world. And like, you know, they go after, you know, settlements and families and what have you. Uh, but on the other hand, though, um, there's a group of mercenaries called Slingers who are paid by uh, people to, you know, take them from one place to another and protect them from the flesh pirates. And so, you know, one particularly, you know, brutal um, war band of flesh pirates is led by a man named Fender, who is a very brutal and sadistic individual. And he, one day, um, one day he and his crew are pursuing um, a woman named Pearl, as well as uh, the slinger who is trying to guide her. You know, but, you know, while the slinger is executed uh, rather brutally, um, they spare Pearl because it turns out that Pearl is a cyborg and she was actually a volunteer for a mission to, you know, take a, a bunch of uh, medical data to one of the few uh, remaining groups of scientists in Atlanta. Um, so that way they can synthesize a cure for the plague. But when Fender, you know, finds this out, you know, he's like, I don't want there to be a cure. 
I, I like the chaos. I, I like causing pain. Yeah, and so, I mean, you know, the apocalypse is Fender's bread and butter. And so, you know, he figures, okay, you know, he and his gang will take Pearl to Atlanta. And so that way, you know, once, you know, they get the cure, you know, they can hold it for themselves. And, and Fender can essentially be like a very, you know, dark messiah, you know, for, you know, what's left of the world. Um, so... You know, once Pearl's kidnapped, um, the trail is picked up by a guy named Gibson, who had actually um, met Pearl beforehand, uh, before she had been kidnapped by um, Fender. Um, and once she had made, you know, her mission known to him, I mean, it was definitely something that intrigued him, the fact that she was a cyborg. But at the same time, you know, he wasn't pursuing her to try and save her. He was pursuing her because, you know, Fender's after her. And it turns out that Gibson, um, who, you know, has been a slinger for some time now, has actually got a very personal score to settle with Fender, uh, seeing as how Fender and his crew had done, had done something um, horrific to um, Gibson's um, surrogate family you know, a long time ago, and, you know, Gibson's been searching for revenge ever since, and so it's like, all these, you know, things kind of just come together, and Gibson uh, pursues Fender, who in turn has Pearl as a hostage, but, you know, Gibson ends up getting a traveling companion and friend of sorts in uh, a woman named Nady who is the sole survivor of a village that Fender and his crew raided uh, so that they that way they could get a boat and you know hit and get to Atlanta with you know adequate transportation and so uh, Nady uh, tells Gibson once he comes upon the village you know what happened and she also tells him you know that she overheard you know Fender and his gang, you know, discussing their plans and what have you. And so, um, Gibson at least has some knowledge of exactly where, um, Fender's going to be going. And so he and Nady set out to cross the wasteland and they have to contend with, you know, all sorts of, you know, factions of, you know, rogue, um, gang members and what have you, excuse me. And so, you know, in the process, you know, as the movie goes on, you know, we, you know, we learn more about, you know, why Gibson wants to go after Fender, you know, as well as, you know, uh, you know, why, uh, you know, Pearl was picked for the assignment to, you know, take the information to the scientists in Atlanta, as well as, you know, exactly, you know, how evil Fender is. But all in all, though, you know, considering that, you know, this movie is kind of a third time's charm experience for me in the sense that the third time was like, whoa, this is actually a good movie. Um, very fascinating movie. I mean, in terms of apocalyptic atmosphere, I would put this movie up there with, say, The Road Warrior. Now, Road Warrior is a masterpiece. I'm not saying Cyborg's a masterpiece, but I'm just saying in terms of conveying a totally post-apocalyptic atmosphere, Cyborg does as good of a job as The Road Warrior, in my opinion, although The Road Warrior is definitely the better movie. Um, I would say um, Cyborg's also, on, you know, another post-apocalyptic movie that comes to mind is The Road. Now, The Road, once again, is a much better movie, um, and Cyborg's definitely more fanciful, but just in terms of, you know, at getting like an atmosphere of hopelessness and loss and what have you. I think Cyborg actually, um, if not matching, say, the road, at the very least, it does a you know good job of you know, being, you know, sort of a contender of it, so to speak. Um, but also, um, I appreciate that, you know, you had some really good camera work and some really good fight choreography, you know, whenever the action scenes were going on, because there's quite a few action scenes, as a matter of fact. So, you know, whenever action's going on, everything looks good, you know, the fights are good uh, and brutal. 
Um, and another thing I thought was pretty cool is that, you know, Gibson's character um, has a lot of bladed weaponry on him and sort of, you know, improvised, you know, firearms. Um, and so it's m more bladed weaponry than firearms. Like, then that's another thing I like about this movie. Um, stuff like firearms are very limited. Um, again, I'm guessing because, you know, bullets, there's a shortage of bullets or something, but uh, both the Flesh Pirates and Gibson uh, tend to use blades more often than not. And he also has this really cool um, uh, trick uh, weapon uh, that's like this blade that's um, hidden in, in one of his boots. And if he, you know, hits it a certain way, you know, it comes out at the tip and he's able to, you know, cause all sorts of damage, you know, against, you know, any of the people that are going up against him and uh, Nady. But, so yeah, I mean, I like the fact that, you know, the the combat seems to be very improvised, I mean, within the movie. I know that there was choreography behind the scenes and everything, but within the movie, everything feels very improvised, like a real fight would be. And so... Um, and I also liked how, um, as badass of a character as Gibson is, I mean, and plus, you know, the fact that he's being played by John Claude Van Damme, you know, you know, he believably is able to hold his own, uh, you know, for a certain amount of time against, you know, Fender and his army. But unfortunately, reality kind of comes into play wherein numbers take a toll, because you know, there are multiple occasions where Gibson is, in fact. Um, defeated, you know, by, um, Gibson and, you know, his, you know, army of flesh pirates, you know, because numbers overwhelm them. And so I like that bit of, you know, realism in some ways, in terms of the fight scenes, because, you know, it kind of goes back and forth, you know, what have you. Um, so, you know, this is a movie that is very heavy on action. And when the action is happening, which is a good amount of the time, you're invested and I would even say in the quieter moments, um, wherein, you know, Gibson and Nady are, you know, connecting with one another and getting to know one another, um, Jean-Claude Van Damme actually does a very good job in the part. I mean, because, I mean, he kicks ass whenever he's fighting and everything because, hey, it's Jean-Claude Van Damme. I mean, he looks good and he is good in a fight. But even though, like, his dialogue is very limited in this movie, he actually manages to convey a lot without saying much um like a lot of emotion like he, i mean there's there are moments where you know you get pathos you know from you know his you know from the tragedy that befell him and his family courtesy of fender i mean you know he's constantly being hit with that in his head and it's like you can feel the pain and so and, and then you have you know the bits where you know the good man he used to be you know, starts to come out here and there, you know, like when he's, you know, getting to know Nady, or, you know, when he starts to actually um, try and, you know, go after Fender to rescue Pearl, as opposed to just get revenge, you know, you actually start to see a good person that used to be start to come out some more. But you also have, um, you know, rather solemn moments, like, um, you know, there, there was one bit I liked where, you um, Deborah Richter, uh, the actress who plays Nady, um, she actually does pretty, you know, good in the part, in her part, too. I mean, she's definitely more verbose than, um, Van Damme is, you know, but at the same time, you, you actually, you know, like her character in the sense that, you know, it's like she tags along with Gibson because, I mean, he could have hurt her, he could have done whatever he wanted to to her, but he didn't. Like, he actually protected her, you know, and and didn't take advantage of her. And so it's like, she appreciates that. And, you know, she actually sees that this is someone that, you know, she can maybe be safe with if she follows him and what have you. So I like the fact that there was that bit of, you know, I'm not gonna say, I'm not sure if hope is the right word, but at the same time, like she had a bit of, there was a bit of purpose that she felt like, especially when, you know, she found out, you know, what Fender was trying to do with, you know, Pearl. And, you know, when she overheard all that, it's like, even though she's just, you know, a young girl who, you know, survived a village massacre and she's not, you know, 
the badass warrior that Gibson is. I mean, she has you know some fighting experience from you know having survived all these years, and so um, you know she is able to you know have something of a heroic mindset in a sense that she wants to find Pearl, so that way you know the world can have a cure for the plague, which is still ravaging what's left of the population. And so, you know, she recognizes that Gibson's going after, you know, Pearl for a different reason because, you know, Fender's with her. And so it's like she tries to, you know, persuade him to see the bigger picture, you know, to look beyond revenge. And I like this sort of back and forth between the two and how it's like, you know, vengeance is first and foremost on Gibson's mind. But, you know, with Van Damme's performance, you know, you do see that, um, you know, Nady's, you know, arguments um, have started to, you know, work their way into his mind, you know, to a point where the climax comes in this full swing. I mean, he's going after revenge and salvation. So I like that. And one of my favorite moments between the two of them, between uh, Van Damme and, uh, you know, Deborah Richter, was... Um, you know, basically, there, there's a, a scene between the two where, you know, they've just, uh, you know, gotten through, you know, getting cleaned off at a beach, you know, that's obviously abandoned at this point. Um, but, you know, they've just gotten cleaned up um, from their journey, and they're taking a break, and they've got a fire going. And, um, you know, Nady, you know, she she's covered with like a towel or a blanket or something, and she you know, lowers, you know, the blanket and, you know, shows herself, you know, to Gibson. And, you know, I mean, it's clearly a moment where, I mean, she she's offering herself to him, not out of fear or anything like that, but because she genuinely, you know, trusts and likes him and she feels safe with him and, you know, cares about him. And so, you know, Gibson, I mean, he, he clearly appreciates what he sees you know, but instead, I mean, what he does is, I mean, it's, it's a very nice moment. Like, he he takes the covering, and he's looking at her in the eyes when he does this, but, you know, he's, he's looking at her, and he takes the covering and just gently puts it back on her, and just, you know. And I like that, because, I mean, it was one of those moments where you see that, I mean, he's still loyal to the memory of his, you know, deceased you know, girlfriend, and, you know, it's, you know, it's something that, you know, I guess in terms of, you know, straight up, you know, emotion, I mean, is something that hits home, I mean, and also a lot, a lot of other people that I've, you know, talked to or read, you know, read um, reviews from on this movie have pointed that scene out, like, even people who didn't like the movie, you know, singled that particular scene out as a moment of very nice act between the two of them in a very human moment and I have to you know agree with that so um so definitely um some acting that you don't expect to find like some good acting that you don't expect to find in a movie like this I mean there you go um but also um Fender um straight up terrifying as far as villains go and i would argue is probably you know the most terrifying of van damme's protagonists i'm you know, sorry antagonists that i've seen in, in the movies of his that i've seen but vincent klein is the actor who plays him and the funny thing is uh he's you know not only was he like a professional surfer you know in real life um which makes his fear his character's fear of water you know in the movie all that much more funnier um, so it's like a bit of, you know, dark comedy. Um, it's like right after they get through slaughtering this village to get the boat, you know, Fender's yelling about how much he hates water. And it's like, well, Vincent Klein's, you know, professional surfer, <laughs> go figure. But anyway, though, Fender though is, I'm not sure exactly what the story was with him. I mean, in a sense of what he was, because on one hand, like he's incredibly strong and, you know, he can take a lot of damage, like more damage than a normal person. But um, he also seems almost demonic in nature because, like, he has like sharp, he has weird, these weird 
inhuman looking teeth and his eyes. Like he has these sunglasses on, like you see on the cover here, you know, but you know, he takes them off and they're these like bright, almost pale blue eyes, you know, that don't look human. And, and, and it's just visually speaking, I mean, Fender's a, a terrifying villain, but Vincent Klein uh, plays him and the way he does it is just, this is a guy, he plays him as a guy who just loves the chaos and there's not much more to him than that. And he goes full in, full swing. And so, um, and the funny thing about you know, his performance is that his voice um, was artificially enhanced, you know, for the movie because uh, Vincent Klein's actual voice is very laid back and, you know, uh, calm and, hey, let's chill out, man, you know, that kind of voice. But, you know, in the movie, though, when they made the uh, modulation you know, for the voice, um, his voice sounds way more intimidating. And it's one of those things where it's like, usually when someone's voice is dubbed, I mean, you know, you're kind of like, no, oh, man, you don't get to hear their actual voice. But here, I think it was a case of, okay, it's a good thing that Klein's voice was dubbed. I mean, nothing against Klein, but his laid back voice would not have worked with that character. And so what they did with Fender's voice, you know, in the movie, it's terrifying. And if you want to hear what it sounds like, um, Method Man, the rapper, uh, did a song called Judgment Day um, you know, a long time ago. And um, th the opening of the song is actually the opening uh, monologue you hear um, from the movie, which is, you know, uttered by Fender. And it's a very chilling um, and memorable dialogue or monologue as far as far as you know movie openings go and so i mean if you, if you want to you know just hear what his voice sounds like in the movie uh check out the opening of uh, method man's judgment day uh, which is also a really cool song by the way so check it check out check out the song both you know to hear how uh, fender's voice sounds in the movie as well as just to hear a good rap song so there you go but anyway though um yeah, I just, I thought that that was kind of funny though. It's like you know you got the professional surfer, you know he's a really nice guy in real life playing like a, you know straight up evil son of a bitch who's afraid of water, <laughs> you know. But, um, but yeah, um, the, another thing that was cool about the movie is that you know you watch Cyborg, and then you know you think about some of the stuff that has come after it over the years like some of the books some of the comic books some of the video games tv shows i mean there's a lot of influence that carries over from cyborg into these things like my brother and i uh, were watching cyborg together um it was his first time seeing it my fourth um but he at, at one point he straight up said this is like you know a, a training you know level on fallout <laughs> you know in, in one particular scene you know uh but and, and I've actually not played any of the Fallout games, but I've seen the game play, and I would have to agree with that assessment. Um, and so it's funny, because like, that's like two movies of Alar Peons that have, you know, in some form of fashion, been influential to video games. You got Radioactive Dreams, and then you got Cyborg. So there you go. Um, but yeah, like, you know, and another thing that comes to mind as far as comic books go is, um, Garth Ennis's Crossed. I mean, you know, you got the Crossed in the in that comic, and then you have the Flesh Pirates in Cyborg. Now, the Flesh Pirates are horrific and you know brutal and sadistic in in the movie, uh, but you know, obviously the Crossed in the comic book, the Crossed are or just I think yeah, it's just it's called Crossed, but the Crossed in that comic book. It's like they take that brutality up to 11. So if you got a weak stomach, do not read Crossed. But I'm just saying, you know, you know, the Flesh Pirates, you know, there's definitely an influence, you know, on stuff like that. Um, you know, but, you know, all in all, though, it's just uh, in terms of apocalyptic cinema or post-apocalyptic cinema, you know, Cyborg's definitely a treat. And like I said, I mean, you know, the, the, the fight choreography is, you know, excellent. Um you know, the actions, you know, very memorable uh, and impressive. And also the camera work, um, the camera work, you know, cinematography, it just looks good. Um, 
you know, whether it be, you know, say for instance, you know, shot, you know, shots where, you know, people are, are, you know, the camera's panning over something or, you know, just, you know, looking at the scenery and what have you. I mean, the film looks good. And there's a lot, there's also um, a really uh, cool uh, callback to Sergio Leone's, um, you know, Once Upon a Time in the West. Um, there's there's a, an iconic scene in that movie, you know, that if you watch Cyborg, um, there's a rather brutal um, fate, you know, there's a, there's a rather brutal form of torture that happens to, you know, Gibson, courtesy of Bender and his crew. And the way the camera work is, as well as the extent of the torture, um, you know, you, you see it. And if you've seen Once Upon a Time in the West, you're like, Albert Pion and his people, you know, they, you know, they, they know their Westerns. <laughs> so, you know, I, I like how, you know, they're, while Cyborg was, you know, in, an inspiration to stuff that came after it cyborg in turn was inspired by you know westerns that came before it so i liked how everything just kind of came full circle in that way but um also the music the soundtrack of the movie um it was by uh kevin bassinson and you know as I understand it, he wasn't the original composer. Um, he was brought in after the disastrous, uh, you know, initial screening of the movie. And, you know, with respect to the composers who, you know, were going to be working on the movie originally, or I should say did work on the movie originally, I think that uh, Masterson, uh, yeah, or Bassinson, sorry. Uh, Bassinson uh, did a very good job with the movie because it's like on one hand, um, like I said, with the action, I mean, there's like this intensity throughout the whole movie. Um, it just almost never ends. And so, you know, the music's intense. But then again, when you have, you know, the quiet moments, you know, things are soft, you know, subdued and sentimental even. And I mean that in a good way. And so, uh, Bassinson, you know, basically uh, just seemed to know he and his crew seem to know, okay, you know, here's the emotion for the scene at hand. Here's how we're going to play things. And so, um, you know, you, you watch the movie, you hear the music, you're not going to forget it. But, okay, so as much as I like the movie, um, I will say that uh, there are a couple of, you know, weaknesses to it. Um, you know, and ironically... Um, the the weakest link in the movie, at least in my opinion, is the actual cyborg Pearl, um, and then and and the actress who plays her, um, Dale Hayden. Um, let me make sure I get this right. Yeah, it's D A Y L E. Okay, because uh, I know Dale. Like I'm thinking like D A L E, and that's usually you know, a guy's name, but this is D A Y L E. You know, so Dale Hayden. She's the actress who played Pearl, and she actually isn't a bad actress, um, at least from what I've seen in this particular movie. Um, but it's more along the lines of you know the problems more along the lines of with her actual character herself because. The movie is called Cyborg, and in terms of marketing, Jean Claude Van Damme's face is plastered all over the theatrical poster art, or just the theatrical art, you know. Uh, but he is not the cyborg. Um, it's Pearl who is the cyborg, and she is um, seldom seen on any of the, you know, theatrical posters or anything like that. So, you know, if you've never seen Cyborg, know nothing about it, you go into the movie thinking that. You know, you're going to watch Van Damme as a cyborg kicking all sorts of post-apocalyptic ass. But while he does kick a post-apocalyptic ass, he's not the cyborg. It's Pearl. And while you do have, um, you know, some occasional moments of visual effects, like, you know, when she takes her wig off and you see all the machinery behind her and on the back of her head, and or like when she's, you know, remembering, you know, how she became a cyborg and stuff like that, um... She's really not in the movie that much, um, just here and there. And I remember, like, you know, when my brother and I were watching it, you know, one of the things he said was that he actually forgot about the cyborg in the movie Cyborg. <laughs> so, you know, I just thought that was ironic because, it's like, you know, the the focus is on, you know, Gibson and his quest, um, and it's like, 
this very atmospheric journey, and and you literally kind of lose track of the cyborg that the movie's named after. <laughs> so I just thought that was kind of you know weird like that. Um, and another thing that I thought was weird is because another thing I thought was weird is that okay, so and I've never been able to quite wrap my head around it. Um, okay, so Pearl volunteered to become a cyborg to take information on the cure to Atlanta. Now, I've been able to put that much together in my times, you know, watching the movie, you know, you know, over the years. Um, because initially I thought I misunderstood it as like, she actually had the cure, you know, in her body or something like that. And for some reason they had to turn into a cyborg because of that. But it's more like, in order to give her the information or for to, to be able to hold on to the information, it's like she had, they had to make her into a cyborg so that she could, I guess, hold it in her head or her brain or something like that. So I'm, I'm able to understand that much, but at the same time, considering how low tech everything is in this particular setting, you know, and how everything's just gone to hell, I mean, and I get the idea that technology is limited, you know, but at the same time, how does turning her into a cyborg, you know, give her, how does that give her the capacity to hold the information to take to Atlanta? I mean, could they have just written something down or, you know, or, you know, put it on a disc that she can take to Atlanta so that way they have the technology they can, you know, read the disc on? I don't know. Um, but yeah, it just, it, while yes, I mean, that justifies the title uh, of Cyborg, I mean, one, she's really not in the movie that much, and two, you know, how does her being turned into a Cyborg, you know, give her the ability to give the cure to the scientists in Atlanta, or at least the information that another group of scientists have to this other group of scientists, you know, so, so that part, if you think about it too much, can be, you know, confusing and you're, you know, scratching your head and what have you. Um, so like, I'm not, you know, looking for a remake of this movie to be made, but if they ever did say, try to do like, say a mini series or a series even, or a straight up cinematic reboot of this movie. I mean, that is something I would like to see addressed. If you're gonna call a movie Cyborg, have more development for the character who's actually a cyborg, and also maybe explain exactly why that character was turned into a cyborg and how that improved her, her or his or their ability to take the information on the cure to Atlanta. You know, just, so people who are wanting to remake Cyborg, you know, take note, please. But also another thing is that um, as much as I like, you know, the main actors in this movie, um, there are occasional moments where um, some of the acting is a little cheesy at times, like mainly, you know, not so much, you know, Fender, but some of the people that, you know, run with him, some of the actors playing them, you know, it, they can come across as kind of cheesy sometimes, like, uh, you know, yelling and shouting and what have you. Uh, it just, like, sometimes it's terrifying, sometimes it's, you know, hokey, you know, but it's more, it's more terrifying than hokey for the most part, but when it is hokey, you're kind of like, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so, there is some cheesiness here, and some would even argue that, you know, the iconic, you know, fight in the rain at the climax of the movie between Gibson and Fender, uh, some would even say that that's cheesy, because um, what ends up happening is, I mean, if you've seen Cyborg, you know what I'm talking about. It's it's an iconic scene. It's like it's pouring down rain, and, you know, Gibson, you know, is finally squaring off with Fender, I mean, after going through hell to get to him, and going through the hell that Fender put him through. And it's a very, very personal, very brutal fight. But basically, you know, both of them, you know, they strip themselves of, you know, any outer covering as far as shirts go. I mean, they're both still wearing pants. But basically, you got two bare-chested guys, 
you know, running at each other, fighting each other, and in Fender's case, yelling and roaring at um, Gibson, you know, throughout almost the whole fight. Um, and so some people, I would, I would say, would find that cheesy, considering, you know, just how nonstop Fender's yelling is. But on the other hand, in a way, it makes his character even more intimidating because, you know, regardless of how much damage he's taking from Gibson, he's still going, he's still roaring, he's still baring his teeth. And it's not just a mustache twirling villain thing, like it's a full on primal evil coming at him. So, I mean, it depends on your perspective, but you know, that, that scene, some people might find unintentionally humorous, you know, but I personally, you know, find it, you know, rather, you know, primal display of revenge, you know, finally being had, um, and, you know, evil finally being, you know, met with its match. So, um, like I said, it just depends on your perspective, but yeah. So, um, yeah, as far as, uh, yeah, so all around, this is a really cool movie. Um, and, and I would highly recommend it, especially if you're a Van Damme fan, a B-movie fan, or a fan of post-apocalyptic cinema. So Cyborg is definitely a good movie. And I, um, much to my surprise, find myself in a position of giving it four stars out of five. Um, this joins the small fraternity of legitimately good movies that Albert Pion has made. And so, um, yeah, uh, as far as special features go, uh, it's, I'm just going to read off the back here, but you got a new 2k scan of the inter positive. Um, unfortunately I'm not really sure what that entails, but it's yeah, there. Uh, but you, but you also have uh, new interviews with uh, director Albert Pion and actors, Deborah Richter and Vincent Klein and, um, the effects of cyborg, uh, theatrical trailer and some other things, but um, one of the things about this uh, about the interviews, I mean, you find out all sorts of behind the scenes stuff. But um, one of the reasons, uh, also, I, I should I should point out something else. Um, the actress who played um, Gibson's girlfriend in the flashbacks um, is a woman. Uh, her name, her character's name was Mary. Uh, the actress's name was uh, Terry Batson. Um, and you know she she looks very beautiful in the movie, um, very lovely, very easy on the eyes. But the first time I saw them, I, I, okay, let me phrase that. The first time since I was a kid that I saw the movie, I thought her acting was terrible. Um, but then I find out, you know, through watching this, like I, initially I was going to put her acting as some of the dodgy acting, like that's you know goes along with some of the you know henchman offender, uh, but. The thing is, you know, the actress, you know, in the documentary and in the interviews, um, you know, she was saying that, you know, her voice was actually dubbed by someone else and she didn't find out until, you know, I, I want to say it was like, you know, when she and her, she went and saw it, the movie in, in the theater, you know, for the first time, you know, with her, you know, friends and family. And they're like, what's up with your voice? And she's like, my God, they dubbed me. <laughs> and so... Um, so it's not entirely, so that's, that, you know, her performance, you know, you know, is, unfortunately it's one of those things where it's like, I can't tell if it's, you know, because, you know, bad acting or bad dubbing, but I'm going to go more with bad dubbing. So I thought that was kind of amusing, but anyway, um, and also that's how I found out, you know, how Vincent Klein's real voice sounds, you know, it's in, in these interviews. And it's, and like I said, it's a good thing that they did something artificial to his voice in the movie, you know, otherwise Fender would not have been the terrifying villain that he is. So, I mean, with respect to Vincent Klein, because you know, I'm sure like he would have tried his best and he still would have been physically intimidating, but once, you know, his real laid back voice came out, yeah, it, it wouldn't have been the same. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, one of the things that, um, I found out about was, okay, so, a couple of things I already knew about the movie, like behind the scenes stuff was, um, uh, originally Cyborg actually came about from two movies that were never made. Um, and the two movies in question were what were going to be the first live action Spider-Man movie and what was going, as well as the, what was going to be the, the sequel to masters of the universe. Um, 
And so Masters of the Universe was a, a movie that was made by the Canon Group, which is the production company that uh, made Cyborg. And so the Canon Group was wanting to make the first live action Spider-Man movie as well as Masters of the Universe 2. And they were wanting to have Albert Peon uh, shoot both movies back to back, you know, because they had a good working relationship with him at the time. And he was good at working at a fast pace. But amongst other things, um, they lost the licensing, you know, to both properties. And so they had already spent all this money on, you know, set uh, locations, on, you know, production design, on, on you know, wardrobe and, you know, and what have you. Um, and unfortunately, <clears throat> because they lost the licensing and they were going through a lot of financial problems at this point, um, they had, you know, all these resources that they'd already put into place for two movies that, well, were never going to happen. And so, you know, they, you know, sat down with Albert Peon and he's like, hey, you know, why don't I, you know, just do a whole new movie? And so the movie that um, he was originally going to do was actually going to have Chuck Norris, of all people, in the lead role. And he was going to be playing a soldier who was trying to make his way across a post-apocalyptic landscape, you know, to, you know, get back home to his family. And he, and the equivalent of the Flesh Pirates in that script uh, were going to be a, you know, basically an army of Satanists, like hardcore, you know, straight up evil, you know, you know, sadistic Satanists. And, and so the interesting thing about that is I think that, I mean, I, I can't say for sure, but I get the feeling that, you know, the people in, in charge of production, you know, they started, you know, designing stuff for that version of the movie because, um, in certain scenes, um, if you look throughout the scenery, you'll see what looks like demonic uh, forms of graffiti, like pictures of demons or devils and what have you, especially at the beginning of the movie. Um, you know, when you first see, you know, Fender and his gang going after Pearl and the slinger who ends up getting, you know, but like you see pictures of devils, like, you know, on as far as like graffiti stuff goes. And so I'm wondering if, you know, they started you know, for the Chuck Norris version where he's going up against an army of Satanists to get to his family in this post-apocalyptic landscape. You know, but then, you know, the Golden Globus, or Golden and Globus, you know, the guys in charge of canon, you know, they're like, no, 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 And they started making some changes and to this, or they had, and they're like, okay, you know, this is going to be a, this is not the movie we want. And so, you know, they changed some stuff around to where um, um, Chuck Norris was out and John Claude Van Damme was in, based on his success with the movie Bloodsport. Which, by the way, um, the movie itself was based on a lie, but as far as like straight up martial arts action goes, pretty badass. So anyway, just throwing it out there. So because of Bloodsport's success, you know, John Claude Van Damme was tapped for the lead role in you know this new movie. And so they uh, changed some other stuff around to where instead of an army of Satanists, you got the Flesh Pirates, which are definitely, you know, terrifying and brutal in their own right. Um, and as far as the cyborg goes, you know, that, it was just kind of thrown in. And and so I, I found that kind of interesting in that, you know, a character who feels thrown in actually was just thrown in you know, Pearl, and so, no disrespect to her, you know, the actress who played her or anything like that, but just the character, you know, more than anything, so I thought that was kind of funny, um, so yeah, I, I, so it's like, it started off as, you know, it was gonna be, it came from two movies that never happened, and then another movie that was gonna happen, you know, as, but then, ended up becoming a totally different movie entirely, you know, but the genesis of, you know, that, you know, third try is still in there somewhere, you know, what with the demonic imagery that you see from time to time with, you know, the graffiti and what have you, uh, but anyway, though, yeah, I just find that behind the scenes info, you know, very fascinating to learn about, but, um, there was, you know, one tragic event that did happen in this movie in real life, um, there was uh, one of the actors in the movie. Let's see. Uh, give me a second here. 
uh, Jackson Pinckney. Um, yeah, he plays one of uh, Fender's Flesh Pirates, and in the climax of the movie, um, John Claude, and, and during the filming of the climax of the movie, um, John Claude Van Damme accidentally blinded him with a, a prop knife, um, like because there's a there's a shot in the movie that um, supposedly. You know, when when you see it happening, that's actually him. You know, being blinded in the eye. Like it's it's real quick, and you and you like you see Van Dam come around with you know the knife or the, it was like the I can't remember if it was the blade or the handle, but basically you know, he gets hit like right here, and supposedly that shot is him. You know, gaining the damage that was going to lead to him being blind in that eye. And so, unfortunately, um, Jackson Pinckney uh, did go blind in that eye, you know, permanently. And um, because of this accident, um, yeah, uh, he ends up, you know, rightfully so, taking Van Damme to court on the thing. And eventually, you know, they settled. And so, um, so yeah, unfortunately, that, you know, tragic event did happen in the movie. And so I, I, I found it kind of... Uh, interesting that you know two you know tragic events happened you know you know one each in an albert peel movie um you know there was you know the the stunt man who acts who ended up you know leaping accidentally leaping to his death in the sword and the sorcerer and then you have uh jackson pinckney who while he didn't get killed he did unfortunately you know get permanently damaged you know in this movie and so, you know, I thought that was, you know, sad to learn about. And I, I think he actually passed away a few years ago. I mean, not from that, you know, but anyway, just, uh, yeah, I found that out. And, you know, I was kind of like, damn, that's, that's a bummer. Uh, but so, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of behind the scenes stuff, you know, that they talk about in the movie or in the behind the scenes in interviews and what have you. Uh, and... You know, so both as a B-movie and as far as behind-the-scenes stuff goes, I mean, Cyborg's definitely um, something, you know, to check out. Um, and, I, and I would even, I would say that, like I said, if you're a Van Damme fan, a post-apocalyptic fan, or a B-movie fan, um, or I'll even say an Albert Peel fan, Cyborg's definitely a good movie, you know, in all those categories. But um, as I'm you already mentioned, I'll go ahead and give uh, Cyborg four out of five stars. Uh, this was a good movie. Um, and I had a, and, and like I said, it's been a very interesting, you know, experience, you know, watching it over a period of time, you know, how you go from one end to the other and then back again. So, uh, but yeah, thank you very much for taking the time to check out my review. Uh, you got any questions, comments, please drop a line, let me know. Uh, I'd love to hear what y'all have to say. I'd love to get y'all's feedback. Um, and if you like what you see here, uh, please feel free to like and subscribe. And uh, thanks again for you know taking the time. Y'all have a good night. Take care. Bye.